Hey everyone and welcome back to another video. It's currently 10 p.m. and this is gonna be a long video just to warn you now. So we are gonna have a glass of wine as we do this. <laughs> also, sorry about how I look, it's late. Today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about photography and do a little deep dive into kind of art analysis and talk about some art history and some really interesting stuff like that. If you saw my Lana Del Rey video, then you'll know that I personally have a very long history with both loving and working in photography <laughs> and it's always been my absolute passion to take photos which is kind of why it's odd that I haven't spoken about it a huge amount on my channel up to now anyway I think because it's always kind of been like my my relaxing thing and my escape and my kind of just for fun thing I've tried to keep it separate from work before but now I'm kind of at the stage in my life and my channel where I'm like screw it I just want to make the videos about things that I'm passionate about and I enjoy it a lot more and it makes the work feel a lot less like work. So we're doing it. Cheers. We're drinking a classic today. It's one of my favorites. It's just a little Picpoule de Pinay, really nice French white wine. This is just the Tesco version, but it is lovely. It, it, it's lovely. It's my favorite wine. If I'm ever at a restaurant and I don't know what to order, always go for a Picpoule because you know it's going to be good. Anyway, today specifically, I want to talk about um, an incredibly influential but somewhat controversial series of photographs taken by Cindy Sherman which she simply titled Untitled Film Stills and they were shot in the late 70s early 80s. So we're going back a little bit but it's still very relevant today I promise you. These images are so loved by many but they're equally criticized by many as well and that's why I find them so interesting. Um, in fact, think about it, I can think of very few other photographers whose work has been analysed, especially from a feminist standpoint, to this extent before or since. Cindy Sherman really is an icon. But regardless of whether you conclude that Sherman and her work are feminist or not, there's no denying that there's something absolutely fascinating about these images and that they've secured a prime place in art history. And so with that in mind today, we are going to be discussing the background to these photos, taking a look at some criticisms published about them, doing a little an and doing a little technical analysis of the photos and You're right there baby. I really hope you can see Kyra's face just poking up. I think I'm just serious. She's being very cute. Sorry, um, so today we're going to be discussing the background to these photos, taking a look at some of the criticisms published about them from both sides of the argument. Um, I'll be sharing some of my favourite images in the series and we'll be doing a little bit of technical analysis and then I'll share my own thoughts and conclusions and what I think we can all learn from this and take away from it. If you are interested in just one particular section of this video because it's going to be a very long one, I will add chapter markers and timestamp them and leave them down in the description below and you can just, you know, skip to whatever bit you find interesting if that's what you prefer to do. Um, and also I will leave a full list of sources and further reading down in the description if you want to check that out as well. Before we start a little bit of self-promotion because these videos always take a hell of a lot of work and never quite get the views that I would like. So since I can't kind of rely on ad revenue with these videos, if you would like to help support me and my channel and help me continue to make work like this that I'm so passionate about and create this kind of content for you guys, then it would be amazing if you want to go check out the print store on my website where I sell my own photography, my own hand-typed poetry and my own art prints as well. A lot of them are handmade, hand-carved and hand-printed lino prints there's lots of cool um, like artwork and stuff on there and um, you're just kind of like getting a little piece of me and my heart for you in your homes. So if you want to support me that's one way you can do that. There's also PayPal for one-off donations and Patreon if you want to get access to um, extra photos I take, behind the scenes stuff, um, script notes and video research notes and that kind of thing and um, there's also a Discord server as well that you can go on and chat with other people. <laughs> yeah, okay, I think that's everything. Thank you for letting me get that out of the way, I appreciate it. Let's jump into the first section. And I wanna start with a little bit of context. So in the first half and middle of the 1900s, film stills were hugely popular. They were basically publicity photos taken on the set of films which would be used for promoting the film or prints would be collected by fans and shared around. As, as you can imagine, these film stills, they captured a single moment of a story. They showed characters midway through an action, sets and scenes with limited context. They were part of the story, but they never quite told the whole story. You needed to go out and actually watch the film to get that. They were, they were just a little teaser, you know? As you can imagine, when women were included in these, in the classic Hollywood era at least, usually they were there to be sex objects or damsels in distress or the careful homemaker or any other number of stereotypes kind of forced on women at the time. 
By the 70s though, cinema was starting to change. The popularity of film stills was starting to decline and people were starting to have more conversations about how women were portrayed in the media and we were becoming more aware of the stereotypes that women were being forced into in the arts, in media, on our screens, what we were seeing around us every day and what we were being forced into in our in our lives. I say we like I was born in the 70s, I know I'm getting old, but I'm not quite that old, but you know what I mean. <laughs> There was by this point in time though already a little bit of pushback happening and women had already started using self-portraiture as a way of exploring gender and their identity in art. Look at the work of Mexican artist and absolute legend Frida Kahlo, French photographer Claude Cahoon, both of them explored gender and identity through self-portraits either via painting or photography and it was iconic. Cindy Sherman herself writes that in the mid 70s, the art world didn't seem to me as macho as it began to feel in the later 70s and early 80s. But maybe that's because there were more artist role models around, like Lydia Benglis, Eleanor Anton and Hannah Wilk. Just the fact they had a presence made a difference. So she was clearly inspired by these women, but sadly she found that this kind of female influence sort of began to decline as the decade went on. So it's almost like a step backwards. And she wanted to be one of the ones to step in and take over and say, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a mark. And she did, which I think is fantastic. In the late 70s, as Sherman was starting to finish up college, she began to experiment with various different art forms, but she found what she really loved was performance pieces that told stories. She loved creating characters and telling a narrative and doing it through her own body and her own personal expression. That said, she mostly enjoyed working alone, which is kind of difficult when you want to do performance art. She liked doing everything herself and having a controlled studio to work in, all of which I can absolutely relate to which is maybe why I love her work so much, but this kind of came back to bite her in the bum a little bit as we're gonna be discussing a little bit later. I know I personally have always had the problem of feeling like I need to do everything myself, which definitely makes things harder sometimes, especially when it comes to work like this. I find doing things like collabs very difficult, even though I want to, I, I find it hard to work with other people on that level, both because of like a social anxiety thing and other issues. So when you actually see someone going out there and doing it all alone and doing everything themselves and it working out for them, it kind of gives you a little hope and inspiration, or at least it does for me. And so that's another re reason that I love Sherman's work so much and kind of relate to it so much. Basically what happened was Sherman began to create a character. She bought this blonde wig and she experimented with makeup and outfits and she started to shoot scenes with herself dressed as this character. She imagined herself as this actress and she wanted to create different film stills from different films throughout her career. And she came away with six black and white portraits of this woman, which she showed first in her university halls and then in a small gallery in 1980, where each photo was simply assigned a number rather than a name. After these proved to be somewhat popular and successful, Sherman found that she actually really enjoyed this process and she began to branch out and create a whole bunch of different characters. Some were directly inspired by actual artists, others were just characters that Sherman kind of plucked out of thin air, inspired by the things around her, a setting she saw, a wig she found, clothes she thrifted, that kind of thing. Um, she'd play around with makeup and wigs and hairstyles, she'd go rummaging through second-hand shops to find old or extravagant clothing. Um, some of the photos you'll notice she even shot wearing her mum's wedding dress, which I think is pretty damn cool. So there were like lots of little things all from her life all coming together to create these completely fictional characters in completely fictional films. Other than the first six shots being the same woman, Sherman generally tried to make sure that each character was completely different and unique. And as part of this, she tried to make sure that each character she portrayed epitomized some kind of stereotype women were supposed to fit into in films and in everyday life. You know, the housewife, the seductress, the victim, the crazy lady, the secretary, the whoever. Some were more obvious than others, but they were all there. As Jessica Sprague-Jones and Joey Sprague wrote in 2011, though, um, these representations of women share at least one trait. They all seem to be the object of another's gaze. We sense in each photograph that some unseen person is present, watching them. Often the women indicate this possibility, seemingly looking, or purposefully not looking, at some specific thing or person just outside of the image's frame, which in my opinion is what makes so many of these photographs so interesting. Um, and this is something we're going to be discussing in a lot more detail throughout this video. Who is watching and why does the woman know she's being watched and how does she react to this? How does this fit with feminist theories like Laura Mulvey's theory of the gaze, which was being published around the time that Sherman first started creating her images? How do the photographer's gaze and the viewer's gaze fit into all this? And what was Sherman's intention when she created these images? 
And does that even matter? While Sherman insists that she wasn't outright trying to create a feminist piece of art, she was just having fun and playing dress up, she does note that there were plenty of aspects of the photos that she was intentional about. She wrote that what I didn't want were pictures showing strong emotion. In a lot of movie posters, the actors looked cute, impish, alluring, distraught, frightened, tough. But what I was interested in was when they were almost expressionless, which was rare to see. In film stills, there's still a lot of overacting because they're trying to sell the movie. And you'll notice this in each of the different like photographs. There's not re really many, I guess, over the top emotions. There's no big shocked faces. There's no overacting. It's all very subtle which again is why I think so many people can relate to it because you're always kind of questioning, well, well what, what is she feeling? What's she thinking? What does this expression mean? Sherman went on to write that the shots I would choose were always the ones in between the action. These women are on their way to wherever the action is or to their doom or have just come from a confrontation or a tryst. In terms of whether she was trying to capture and or subvert stereotypes when she was creating her images, she writes, I'm not sure if I was yet aware of the fact that in most early films, women who don't follow the accepted order of marriage and family, who are strong rebellious characters, are either killed off in the script or see the light and become tamed, joining a nunnery or something. Usually they die. I think I must have been unconsciously drawn to those types of characters, which is perhaps why so many of her characters seem scared, or how certain photos have incredibly ominous vibes, or on the other hand, we get a lot of strong, independent, confident women, which we all know I love to see. <laughs> For the outdoor shots that Sherman uh, created, she generally create a character beforehand, travel to a location with a friend or partner or family member, set up the shots that she wanted, get in position, and then call out to her helper or friend or whoever to just hit the shutter button for her. Everything else was done by Sherman, she just needed someone there as a finger to just press press the button. Um, in others though, she tried to use a tripod and self-timer, and she was she, sometimes successful. Sometimes. Not always. <laughs> Sometimes things went wrong, like the camera slipping from the tripod, or the focus being off slightly, or light leaks in films, which happens when you're working with film, or any number of other things. It comes with the territory of shooting in this kind of style, and it's something that I spoke about in the Lana Del Rey video, that it's one of the things I absolutely love so much about working with film, is the unpredictability. And honestly, um, I find it makes shooting film incredibly exciting and fun and creative and kind of pushes you to your limits and it gives your photos so much character and atmosphere and this is what we actually find in a lot of the shots by Sherman that, well, you know, where something did go wrong, where the camera moved, where you know, the tripod slipped or whatever, you get a lot more character and atmosphere. There's one, I think, of her coming out of a lake where the camera moved on the tripod and everything's kind of blurry and out of focus and in the wrong position, and it all just looks very ominous and creepy and you have all these questions, there's so much atmosphere, and I, I love it. I think it's so much better than anything that would have been created if she'd just taken a shot as normal and everything had been technically perfect, you know? Those like happy little accidents sometimes make the art, and it's having the eye of an artist that lets you pick them out and say, actually, this wasn't what I intended, but damn it works. You know, that's, that's something that I guess the best artists can kind of see and work with. And then from there, obviously, you know, the, the, the editing and working with it, like a dark room and creating the image that we see in front of us. It's great. For the indoor shot, Sherman usually shot in her own home or in locations close by to her. Uh, she liked to dress them up and light them in interesting ways to make them look like different places, which I think is just genius. Uh, she's shown you that you don't need to have big budget, fancy studio setups and all that stuff. You just need to work with what you have and get creative. She'd do things like hanging fabric and moving furniture around and buying stuff in thrift stores and dressing up her flat to make it look like completely different locations every time. Her use of mostly natural lighting combined with carefully positioned lamps and other everyday lighting is something that I find absolutely inspiring. Occasionally she'd use like a flash gun or she basically had this rig where she just like screwed light bulbs into it and moved it around and we can actually see this in one of the shots. It's one of my favourite in the collection because she uses this rig with the four small spotlights, although only three of them are visible in this image, and they're positioned behind Sherman facing directly towards the camera. I assume there's also a little bit of ambient lighting, maybe like overhead lighting in the room or something like that, you know, just a regular light bulb sort of thing. 
because we can see the rest of the room is still well lit, uh, we can still see details in the rest of the room, but the focus is really on those bright lights facing the camera. And I love how they create those beautiful lens flares, how they obscure our subject's face and expression so we don't really know what's going on or what she's thinking. I love how they make her silhouette stand out from the background, they make her blonde hair glow, it's, it's beautiful. Like it's clearly all been put together and set up, but it looks so effortless that it could just be natural. And that's the genius of Sherman. You look at this photo and it could just be a woman sitting in her flat who happened to have a photo of taken of her. But then you're like, well, why is the lighting there? Why is she wearing heels in the house? What can we tell about her from her surroundings? Like her shoes are expensive, but her flat looks basic. She has books and plants and newspapers lying around. And so she's clearly well read and cultured and cares about things. So is she a student? But then again, the shoes look expensive. So maybe not. It's amazing. It's intriguing. You have all these questions. You want to know the story. You want to know what's happening. I love it. I have been looking at these images now for, I was first introduced to them by um, a media teacher of mine when I was 16, 17, I think. And every time I look at them over and over again, I see more things, I see different things, I interpret them differently. And you know, if 12 years on, I'm still finding new stuff, you know they're good images. I also feel like every time I go back and look at them when I'm a little bit older, I see something a little bit different. I relate to something in a slightly different way. And again, that's the beauty of good art, is that I think it grows with you. No, oh, Cairo disagrees, apparently. <laughs> Love you, Bean. But this is what I mean, right? This is the beauty of Sherman's photography. Even without deeper analysis, academic analysis, if you want to put it that way, even without knowing anything else about art history or film criticism or feminism or anything, you can get something out of these photos because they tell a story. So while for the rest of the video we are going to be analysing these from a feminist perspective, I want to make it very clear that regardless of the conclusion you come to about whether these images are feminist or not, I don't want that to influence whether you like these photos or not. I think that you can argue that they're slightly problematic while still enjoying the narrative put forward in each image. You can still think they're beautiful images even if they're not feminist. Likewise, you might think, yeah, these images do great things for feminism and representations of women, but they don't appeal to me. And that's okay too. I think you can see the good in something or the bad in something and choose to like it or not like it on maybe like an aesthetic level separately and that's all right. As is any combination of the above mentioned things. Uh, like I said, that's kind of the beauty of Sherman's photography to me. It encourages you to think and form your own opinions and, and each of these images will say something completely different to every person who looks at them. And I think they're very, very accessible to everyone regardless of your background and who you are and what you've seen or learnt or read about before. I think every different person is going to bring a little bit of their own life to these images and take something different away. And I think that's beautiful. I actually found a great quote from an interview of the Sherman that sums up my feelings pretty perfectly. So this was in 1987, so a few years after the photos had been out and published and everything. Uh, she said, I wanted to make something which people could relate to without having to read a book about it first. Sometimes I wonder if maybe it's all a lot of crap. Maybe the work doesn't mean anything. When they're writing about it, they're just finding whatever to attach their theories to. I just happen to illustrate some of those theories. And that's something that I want you to keep in mind as we go forward with the rest of this video. In their 2016 book, How to See the World, an introduction to images from self-portraits to selfies, maps to movies and more, Nicholas uh, Murzoff, I hope I pronounced that right, wrote that in Untitled Film Stills, Sherman set out to counter the construction of women as passive objects of male desire. But based on what Sherman herself has said about these images, I'd argue that this isn't true at all. I believe Sherman set out to have some fun and create some characters and create art for art's sake. And in the process, she just ended up creating something which could be interpreted as countering the construction of women as passive objects of male desire almost by accident. And I think this is a super important distinction to make between an artist's intention and the viewer's interpretation. Just because you interpret something and it's a widely accepted interpretation, that doesn't mean it's what the artist intended. As we've discussed in quite a few of my other videos now, all media is encoded by the creator. They come up with a meaning and then they create something that they think shows that meaning. It's the job of the artist or creator to convey their meaning in the most accurate way possible. The media is then put out into the world and the creator loses control of that meaning altogether. 
we've spoken about this in my videos on death of the author and so on. The media is then consumed by the audience who decode it in various ways. Their own experiences and background and education and all sorts of things will shape the way in which the audience does this and derives meaning from the piece. Different people will decode the same piece of art or piece of media in vastly different ways and that's what I find so interesting. This goes for absolutely everything. Uh, film, TV, photography, painting, writing and poetry, even advertising, YouTube videos, fashion. If the artist did a good job, the majority of the audience will see the message and meaning that the artist intended, but if not, they may interpret something completely different. It's difficult because this is where we have, like I mentioned, death of the artist or death of the author to contend with. And the artist has to deal with the fact that the audience will read the piece however they read it. And they have to be prepared for that before they put it out into the world. However, we have to consider that if someone reads something into a piece of work that was never intended, how much of that is the artist's fault or how much of that is the artist's responsibility? It's difficult, but it's an interesting topic to consider and one that's relevant here today. Like I say, um, it's a video that sadly mentions you know who, but I did do a video on death, death of the author, basically called like, why did this poem offend me so much? And it, it's kind of an interesting one if you wanna hear a little bit more about this and get some more background, but if not, that's okay too. You've got a brief overview. I'm sure you're smart enough to apply what I've just said to the rest of it. Anyway, bear it in mind as we go forward. You're, you're good. So, while often artists will have a message that they wanna encode into their art, sometimes they don't. Sometimes an artist will not encode one specific message into their art, like in the case of Cindy Sherman and Untitled Film Stills. She was simply a young woman having fun, creating art for the sake of creating art and enjoying herself, influenced by the world around her and the media around her that she was consuming and that she enjoyed and when she showed it the world it gained a level of popularity she never expected and then everyone and their dogs started to analyze it and this is where the controversy arises because you have two absolutely completely contrasting readings of these images with each side thinking that theirs is the absolute only right way to interpret them thus holding sherman up to a gold standard of feminism or as a traitor to all women you know depending on what side you're on. Meanwhile, Sherman is sort of stuck in the middle and left feeling unsure about even her own work, questioning it over and over and over for decades to the point where now she's just kind of sick of it and she's like, yeah, it was popular, I had fun at the time, but now I kind of don't want to talk about it anymore. And I totally see where she's coming from, I get it. And the other reason she is so damn relatable, I love her. On the one hand, you have Team Feminist who think Sherman is absolutely smashing the patriarchy with these images. She is taking all these stereotypes that men have forced on women and she is subverting them, she is reclaiming them, she is owning them. She's critiquing the male gaze and overpowering it with her own gaze by being both in front and behind the camera simultaneously. And then on the other hand, you have Team Traitor, who thinks Sherman is actually just feeding into the stereotypes and encouraging the male gaze. They think, well, she can say she's subverting it, but men will still sexualize and, ob and objectify her, and she's just letting it happen. Sherman is part of the problem to these people. She is making everything worse. So which is it? Honestly, I can see both sides and I don't think either side is completely wrong or completely right. And so that leads me to ask the question, can two diametrically opposing opinions both be right at the same time when it comes to interpreting art? Is Sherman's work both feminist and anti-feminist at the same time? Can it be both fighting misogyny and enabling it at the same time? Spoiler, I don't have solid answers to these questions, not by a long shot. <laughs> I also think it's very important to note that Sherman was incredibly young when she made this series of photos. She was in her early 20s, it was her first big art project, it's the first one that got any kind of recognition, and recognition that she wasn't expecting, and she made the most of it, because more power to her, why wouldn't you? She was still figuring out who she was when she made these images. She was still figuring out what her ideas and her personal values were. She was still learning about the world around her. She was still growing. And that's something that's so important to remember when we look at these images. This isn't a wise 50 year old woman creating these images now in this day and age with all the knowledge that we have now. This was a 20 something year old woman, you know, in this world that was still like struggling and fighting its way through feminism. We hadn't quite hit proper third wave intersectional feminism yet. She was still figuring things out. The world was still figuring things out. 
she was still incredibly naive compared to what the average 20 year old is today, so we have to bear all this in mind. Naive when it comes to feminist theory and so on. And it's important to remember that we can see her growth in later works and how her earlier works influenced her later works and how the, the later works became more overtly feminist, they became more intentionally feminist, they became more inclusive and so on and so on. So it's worth bearing that in mind. That said, I imagine if Sherman made and released these images today, there would be similar arguments made about them, but instead of generating decades worth of debate like these have, I imagine today the internet would just... <sighs> One side would shout louder than the other, and Sherman would be hailed a hero or a villain, and that would be it. The louder side would shout and shout, and any contradictory opinion would just be shut down, because sadly that's how the internet seems to work these days. It's very black and white, it's either this or this. There's none of this back and forth and discussion, and maybe it can be two things at once. And that's why I think this particular case study into Sherman's work is so important and influential, and it's important and relevant to speak about now because it teaches us that situations like this aren't just black and white. Work isn't just good or bad. Media and art and things we create, it's not just positive or negative. It's not just feminist or misogynistic. Maybe it can be both at the same time. Maybe there's more nuance to these situations than the internet likes to think there is. Imagine if Sherman had released this series of photos in the kind of online atmosphere that we have today and the your misogynistic crowd had been the loudest and won out, do we think she would have had the guts to keep working? Would she have had the courage to grow and learn and develop her views and her skills? And would she have created the important and influential feminist work that she went on to create afterwards if she'd have been working in this kind of environment? It kind of makes me ask, is this kind of overly judgmental online atmosphere that we kind of currently live in, is it stifling creativity and growth? Critique is super, super important because it helps us grow and we should never ever shut down constructive critique. Look at this example here with Sherman where it helped show her the flaws in her work and how to combat them, but that's critique and debate. All out shaming might have just stifled her and held her back and stopped her from fulfilling her true potential and stopped her from creating all this incredible art that we now have to enjoy and discuss and talk about and art which has been, you know, overwhelmingly positive in the whole. On the whole? As a whole. Holy. The point I'm trying to make is that hopefully by looking at cases like this and evaluating opinions on both sides, we can start to see that things are a little more complex than the internet would have us believe, and maybe we'll be a little more hesitant to just jump on one side or the other in reaction to a piece of media going forward. So let's start with the negative stuff, because while Sherman's critics are admittedly in a minority, they are a very loud minority, and they do actually raise some really excellent points that are worth considering, even if you are on the pro-feminism side of things. As I mentioned previously, around the same time that Sherman was creating her photo series, Laura Mulvey first published her incredibly influential paper, on the male gaze, which has influenced media and art ever since. And because of this, people began to apply this theory to Sherman's work, even if Sherman herself did not when she was first creating it. Sherman wasn't really aware of this theory when she, theory when she was creating her art, but when critics began to analyze her art, obviously they went to this exciting new and very influential and very important theory that was being spoken about at the time. To give you a very, very brief summary, and anyone who's taken a media studies course will almost definitely have heard of this before, um, Mulvey wrote a lot about gazes in the cinema and the media in general. That is ways of looking at people, who is looking, why, what are they getting from this, and the gender imbalances that came along with this. Laura Mulvey suggested that up to this point in mainstream film and media, men were primarily there to act and to push the narrative forward, while women were mostly there passively to be looked at by men, both the characters in the film and the male audience at home. Women were looked at because men wanted her and women wanted to be her, rarely more than that. We see this through the use of certain camera angles, lingering shots on certain body parts, the way sh some shots are framed. It was 
very, very typical for women to merely be objects in film rather than any kind of active participants. She brought terms like voyeurism and scopophilia to the forefront of the conversation, and they're ones which are very, very important to this con conversation. So when we look at certain images, I want you to have a think about this and think, well, can someone be sexually gratified by this image? Are they going to enjoy this image? What are they going to get out of it? Are they going to enjoy the act of looking and, and so on? In her 1975 paper titled Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, which is an absolutely fascinating and game-changing read for anyone interested in me media theory and its history, I thoroughly recommend it. I first read this paper again, Mr Richardson recommended it to me when I was like 16, 17, and it's one that has come back up in my work over and over again over the years in various forms. It's, it's a game changer. It's like the big game-changing theory that all the other theories that we have today were kind of built on when it comes to feminist media theory and so on. Anyway, so the point is Mulvey wrote that in a world ordered by sexual imbalance, pleasure in looking has been split between active male and passive female. The determining male gaze projects its fantasy onto the female figure, which is styled accordingly. In their traditional exhibitionist role, women are simultaneously looked at and displayed, with their appearance coded for strong visual and erotic impact, so that they can be said to connote to be looked atness. She went on a little later to write, Traditionally, the woman displayed has function on two levels, as erotic object for the characters within the screen story, and as erotic object to the spectator within the auditorium, with a shifting tension between the looks on either side of the screen. Once this theory was out there and people became aware of this power imbalance, both critics and creators of media began to ask, how can we combat this? What about the female gaze? What are women currently seeing? What do they want to see? How can we change things so women no longer feel passive and are active? And so people began to look at Sherman's work through this lens, unsurprisingly. While many argue that Sherman was trying to subvert these traditional values and reclaim the gaze for herself and other women, which we'll talk about in the next section, there were also plenty of people who claimed she absolutely failed at this and instead just fed into the male gaze, gave them what they wanted. Look at images like number 52 and number 36, both shot in 1979. We see a very typical male view with the camera focused on the curves of the female body as she lies there, maybe asleep, but also kind of somewhat seductively, or is in a state of literal half undress. We see the women's faces and therefore identities and personalities are obscured by either cropping in the first one um, or use of silhouettes. She could literally be absolutely anyone in either of these images, especially the second one, 36, thus reducing her to just a passive object to be looked at rather than an individual. And so we have to ask, are these parodies of other photos which objectify women in this way? Or are they just outright objectifying women? And I asked this question, despite number 36 here being one of my favourite of all time in the absolute ser in, in the entire series, I think this is a stunningly beautiful photo with layers and god it, it, it's gorgeous I love this image so much but I still have questions about it. One critic Margaret Iverson vehemently argued the latter claiming that Sherman's photographs present the female body in the third person. She poses as object of the gaze in relation to he actively taking a passive exhibitionist aim. While Mira Score labelled Sherman's work as disturbingly close to the way men have traditionally experienced or fantasised women, and said that this is why the photographs became popular with so many men at the time, they found themselves able to relate to it on a level that they were used to without it really challenging them. Critics like this kind of basically say if this was real feminist art, men would feel uncomfortable looking at it, but it's a little too close to what they're used to and they get purely sexual enjoyment out of it and aesthetic enjoyment and aesthetic pleasure uh, without really being challenged or asking themselves any questions about should I be seeing more than just a sex object here. And so this brings us to another really really important question. If a piece of work conforms to certain norms in order to attract a particular crowd and then later gets them to question their own ideologies, is this in some way better or worse 
or more or less effective than a piece of work that just outright rejects all norms and therefore potentially alienates the audience it needed to educate? I don't have answers. I think there's a place for each kind of art in, in different places. That said, many argued that Sherman was just doing the whole appealing to men thing without getting them to question anything at all and was therefore reinforcing the male gaze rather than critiquing and reclaiming it. An unnamed writer for the Art Gallery of Ontario quite brutally suggested that Sherman was, in fact, consolidating and securing women under the historical patriarchal male gaze as fetishized objects of male fascination and desire. <laughs> God. <laughs> They did not pull their punches. <laughs> and the thing is, I would argue, if you take certain images alone and out of context, for example, the ones we just looked at, 36 and 52, take them out of context and look at them on their own, and I can absolutely see why some people come to these conclusions. But in context, when the entire series is displayed together and you see it as a series and not just a collection of individual images, when these sexualized, fetishized images are displayed alongside other images like number 27 or number 26, I think the subversion becomes more apparent. However, we're going to keep coming back to this, counterpoints, um, however this raises more questions because does the fact that the perceived meaning of these images changes with context make them more or less interesting, better or worse? more or less feminist? Is it a problem that you have to view image A alongside images B, C and D to get the full message? Or should you be able to get little snippets of the same message from viewing A alone, B alone, C alone and so on? I personally enjoy the fact that the context changes the meaning and that you can look at one image alone and come up with this whole story and message and meaning and one reading and then you view it in a different context, maybe next to another image and suddenly everything changes. I think that makes it multi-dimensional and more interesting, but I know some people don't like that and I can understand why they have problems with it. And we also have to remember that some people may just stumble across one of these images on their own without being in context. And if that creates a problematic message, we kind of have to address that too and say, is this a problem? How do we combat that? So no solid answers. Yay! <laughs> Jessica Sprague Jones and Joey Sprague argue that if many of Sherman's images were displayed in public, how would the public distinguish them from the elements of populist culture they are intended to critique? As in their words, Sherman does not present a new empowering way of understanding gender and women's oppression, nor does she identify the people and structures responsible for inequality and domination. Instead, it's all left up to the viewer to try and figure that stuff out for yourself, which only becomes easier to do once you see all the images together in their full context. And this is where the problem arises if you only see one or two images by themselves. And so in that sense, I'd actually argue that this series of images is actually a pretty damn good representation of art and media in general. It's like sometimes we see one thing on its own and we have this emotional response to it, but once we see it in a much larger context, it changes how we feel about it. This is just how the world works, you know? For example, one beautiful photograph of a beautiful woman alone might be something that we enjoy looking at. We can appreciate its beauty. We can see it as a celebration of the female body, maybe. We can find it just, we can just find it aesthetically pleasing. We can say that it's a technically good photograph. It was executed well, maybe. However, depending on the wider context of that image, it may become A, a powerful image for female empowerment or B, yet another cog in the wheels of female exploitation. To figure out which one, we need to look at who took the photo, why, what other, other photographs were taken, where is the power both inside and out of the image and so on. For example, a technically beautiful photo taken by a woman of other women to empower them and make them feel strong and make them feel good and make other people and make other people feel strong and powerful and good. Female empowerment. But a man who's just really good at using a camera, but he's an absolute creep and he exploits women, and he's taking photos of women to say it's art, 
but really he's just getting off on getting women half naked on camera and creeping over them and whatever and he does this every day and whatever like exploitation you know context matters <laughs> We very briefly discussed earlier the idea of how women in particular use self-portraiture in art to reclaim their bodies as their own. How can a man assert his power over them with an objectifying gaze if the woman is the one telling them where to look and what to look at and how all for? If the woman is in control of who is looking at her and when and why, is that empowering? For some, it absolutely is. It's supposed to be a reclamation of power for women. However, you also have to remember that when Sherman was making these images as, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, I looked up her name on like seven different sites and how to pronounce it, I think it's Jui Chi Lu, I think, please correct me if I'm wrong. She writes that in those years many feminist artists and scholars increasingly came to con the conclusion that no representation of the female body could altogether dispense with its habitual objectification and eroticization under the patriarchal visual regime. Female body imagery was therefore banned by many fe feminist artists and critics. Basically, at the time, lots of women were like, damn, men are objectifying us in our bodies, let's just not show them our bodies. And if you show anyone your body, men are gonna objectify you, so just don't, okay? Whereas you had certain women come along and say, no, screw this, my body's mine, I'm gonna do what I want with it, but I'm gonna control who looks at it and when. It's my right as a woman to be looked at when I want to be looked at and not when I don't. So there were two very like different views going on. But the most popular was this don't show your body, baggy clothes, cover up, don't give men what they want. So by Sherman doing the outright opposite of what mainstream feminists, which I know feels weird to say, artists were doing at the time, can we say she was being more or less feminist than the others? She was shaking up the status quo amongst feminists and therefore pushing feminism forward to an even more equal and inclusive place of women, do what you want with your bodies as long as it's your choice. But in doing so, she was also maintaining the allowing men to look at us and objectify us if they want status quo. So Sherman couldn't really win. Was what she was doing, was she pro-feminist or anti-feminist? Was she making it better or worse? Mm, whatever she did, she couldn't win. Or, if we look at it another way, she couldn't lose. God, this is what I mean about there being so much nuance to this situation. It isn't just a matter of these photos are good or bad, helpful or harmful, feminist or misogynist. I think it's possible for them to be everything all at once, and different things to different people, and different things at different times depending on when we're looking at them and who we are, and I think that is the beauty of art. Absolutely! This is what good art does. It changes with time. We interpret it different ways, depending on what culture we've grown up in, what the political climate currently is, who's looking at it, who's showing it to us, who's talking about it, what are people saying about it, what did the artist intend or not intend, all these things, just good art exists on multiple planes. The same image can be looked at by so many different people and so many different things will be seen. This is why I think take a very iconic painting that everyone knows like Starry Night by Van Gogh or Van Gogh if you're American and everyone loves that painting because it's beautiful, it's stunning, it's gorgeous but different people are gonna see different things when they look at that painting so from what I heard the backstory of that painting was that he actually painted it when he was in an asylum so some people will look at that painting and they'll see his mental state at the time and they'll relate to that and they'll understand that and they'll connect with him on this deep emotional level and they'll be like I see you. Other people will look at it from a technical perspective and look at the brush strokes and the texture and the gorgeous impasto on the canvas and they'll look at his use of colour and shapes and movement and they'll see all of that. Other people will just say, well it's really pretty and it's aesthetically pleasing and I enjoy it. And so many people will see a combination all of that and then so much more and they'll see this and this and this and they'll have read this theory and it'll influence this or it reminds me of this book and it did this or they'll see and say the, the Van Gogh episode of Doctor Who and they'll be like, oh well that reminds me of and, and so on and, and they'll connect with it on that level or they'll um, have read a book on Van Gogh when they were seven years old and it brought them into the art world and they'll remember that and they'll see oh, 
different people have different experiences and the same painting can turn into a, a million paintings with a million people looking at it and I think that's what makes art so beautiful. If you had an artist who sat there and said, no, my painting means this, my art means this, my book means this, my video means this, and if you're not reading it this way, you're reading it wrong, then they're not really an artist, they're just like a, a dictator, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Art exists to be interpreted and enjoyed and discussed. It exists to make people emotional and that's the beauty of it. Okay, sorry, that was an inscripted rant. Um, <laughs> okay, back to where we're at. This video is long enough already without me going on rant, sorry. Anyway, here we go. So, this entire point that I was trying to make is still particularly relevant in many areas today. Not just in art, but think about the big debates we see around the world. For example, sex work which is still primarily done by women and therefore is still a very feminist issue. Now that there are more ways of women doing sex work online, which takes some of the physical danger out of the mix for them and essentially allows certain women to work for themselves or work independently or work from home or, or whatever, we have to ask, are the women who are choosing to do sex work and monetize their own bodies being empowered or are they willfully participating in their own exploitation? And as always, I don't think it's a one-size-fits-all answer. And we, we can ask the same question about Sherman's photos. Is she empowering herself and other women by utilizing her body in this way? Or is she complicit in her exploitation by men by displaying her body in this way? And it's never gonna be a case of it's all exploitation or none of it is. It's never gonna be that there's nuance, there are technicalities, there's, there's lots of interesting stuff to discuss, but none of it's simple but it's worth discussing and talking about. In an interview that Sherman gave in 1991, she admits herself that there are flaws with her work. She said, I also want to show that the characters themselves were as confused as I was and frustrated by the roles that they were being forced to play. But I never thought of it as some sort of, oh, idea about the male gaze, you know? There are men looking at these women and fantasizing about them. But now I can look back on some of them and I think some of them are a little too blatantly obvious, too much like the original pinup pictures of those times. So I have mixed feelings about them now as a whole series. One of the other really big criticisms about Sherman's untitled film stills is about representation in general. And it's a really, really big, important one. And I think it raises some very valid concerns. So Jessica Sprague Jones and Joey Sprague, again, we're talking about, I, I mentioned them a lot. They're, they're probably Sherman's biggest modern critics. So I'm referencing quite a lot of their work in this. Um, they probably offer some of the most comprehensive coverage of this issue of representation in their 2011 paper titled The Standpoint of Art Criticism, Cindy Sherman as Feminist Artist. Their main argument is that while Cindy Sherman seemingly portrays many stereotypes of women, when you actually look closely, they're mostly just the stereotypes applied to and experienced by white, middle-class, cisgender, heterosexual women, and therefore they don't capture the true, true experience of women as a whole. They write that nowhere, for example, are the stereotypes held against black women. Similar points could be made, made about the racially specific stereotypes used against Asian women or Latinas. In fact, in Sherman's body of work, even images that represent poor working class white women are rare. Before finally summarizing that the film stills seem to be talking to a racially and economically privileged audience, which is a damn excellent point. Don't know why I started doing the clapping thing again. Is this a, is this a wine thing? No, I don't want them sober as well. Why do I do this? <laughs> not that I'm drunk now, I've had like a glass of wine, uh, not the point, anyway. There is no denying that representing all types of women in media and art is crucial, absolutely crucial, especially when it comes to discussing what it means to be a woman and the female experience in general. And therefore it's so important to recognize that Sherman is only ever portraying a small section of what it means to be a woman in this particular work. Her later work becomes a little more inclusive, but maybe not as much as some, but still, she's just one woman. I, and this may be slightly controversial, but I personally don't mind that this one particular work of untitled film stills isn't representative of absolutely everyone for a couple of reasons. One being simply that it's not claiming to be. It's never even really set out to be a feminist piece, it's never once claimed this is what it's like for all women. Instead, Sherman just wanted to focus on sharing her own experience as an individual. Her experience of, this is how I've seen women, 
this is how I've personally been told to behave, this is what has been forced on me personally. And for that reason, I don't think it's fair to shame someone for only talking about their own experience, especially when they're still young, they're still learning, and they're still experiencing things for themselves, which she was when she created this series of photographs. Secondly, I don't think it would be practical for Sherman to portray the experiences of many other people. For example, people of different races based on the way she works. So Sherman is a lot like me in how she works, as I mentioned before. She likes to work completely alone and do everything herself. And like I say, I relate to that a lot. For me, it's because of a mix of major social anxiety and some social issues I have related to being autistic. I, I struggle working around other people too often and when I do work with other people, it's usually only after I've known them a long time and I'm very comfortable with them and they have to be a very certain kind of person. And I, I was on Elise's podcast the other month and um, that's our first collab we've ever done together despite knowing each other for about two years and being good friends for at least a year. Like we've hung out multiple times and spent a lot of time together and kind of text near enough every day. But that's the first time we've like worked on a project together because it's, it's very difficult for me to put myself in that environment with other people. So the point is I can't speak to Sherman's reasons for working alone, but the fact that she does prefer to, it means that her work comes with limitations. And I think we need to be respectful of that and understanding of that and take that into account. And, or it, it's not that she's trying to exclude anyone, it's that she can't include them. And there's a difference. There's a huge difference. Um, I also believe, thirdly, and this is the point that I think could be quite controversial, I think it's impractical for people to expect every single work to be representative of everyone. I think it's important to look at and understand individual works of art in the context, in the context of the art world in general. Representation in media and art as a whole is incredibly important and something we need to be incredibly critical of and aware of and pushing for. So I think if we look at, for example, feminist art as a whole, and we can see, for example, damn, there's not a lot of representation of black women or disabled women or trans women or insert any other group here, then we need to recognise that that is a problem and ask, why is this happening? Why are they not being represented? represented in the ways they should. How can we change this? How do we increase representation? How can we make sure they have a voice? That's incredibly important within the art world as a whole, within the feminist art world as a whole, within certain genres as a whole, and, and so on. I think the solution will be to boost the voices of artists who are missing, but this doesn't mean that everyone needs to be present in every single individual work. Sometimes it's okay for work to just be about the artist as an individual's experience. So it's easy to sit there and criticise Sherman because they're saying, well, she's just a cis white middle class woman. She needs to be more inclusive. But she's allowed her experience and she's allowed to talk about that and share that without having to include anyone else just as if a working class black woman wants to create art about her experience raising kids in an inner city, I'm not going to sit here and say, yeah, but what about that uh, middle class transgender Indian woman who's child free by choice? Why aren't you representing her in your work? I think as long as all of these women have a place in the art world and they're all given equal opportunity, and they're all being boosted to the same level, that's what's important. We need to be boosting all the voices rather than cutting down certain ones. That said, some people may argue, well, there are too many cisgender, white, middle-class, heterosexual women, and therefore they're drowning out the voices of the minorities, and, and obviously that's a problem as well. But that wasn't necessarily the case when this photo series was being made. We need to remember that when Sherman was creating these images, we, at the time it was radical for almost any woman to achieve any kind of notoriety in art, never mind the sort of sh success that Sherman achieved, and that no work exists in a vacuum. 
So we need to understand that this series was just one small stepping stone. It was one of the foundational blocks in helping other women get their voices out there. Sherman wasn't successful because she was talking over minority women. She was successful because she managed to claw her way out above men who were shouting over her. And because she managed to do that, she then helped propel the voices of other minority women to come up and, you know, be alongside her and overtake her and so on. She helped pave the way so that other women, both like her and not like her, could come along and share their stories, their experiences, their lives. If it wasn't for people like Sherman starting out here at the bottom, it might have taken even longer for other women who are minorities or who might not have ac had access to the same privileges that Sherman had and the resources that Sherman had. It might have taken longer for them to be heard and seen and noticed and recognised. Sure, this work isn't enough on its own, but what is? We need lots of small victories that build up over time and we can't just be dismissive of them all. That said, I do think it's a huge shame that her work, which is so well known, only represents one type of woman. And I do wish there were more women represented in there. But I think as long as we acknowledge who's missing and why they're missing and that they have a voice and opinion too, it's not a huge problem. It's not that we're trying to erase those voices, we're just recognising that those voices are elsewhere in this particular work. It's so important to remember when we look at work like this, even though it's so famous now, that doesn't mean that the voices and stories and experience and work of the women not shown in this series aren't important too. As I said before, she misses out women of colour, women with disabilities, trans women, working class women, non-heterosexual women and so on. And it would have been nice to even just have a reference to a few more of those in her work in some way or another so that we're more aware of them and we can at least go out and look for their work and their voices outside of this individual's experience. While there are many, many criticisms of Sherman and her work and her untitled film stills, it is not all criticism, of course. So many people see so much merit in Sherman's work and they still receive high praise today. It's why they are probably one of the most well-known, popular, famous photo series by a woman out there. So let's talk about this. And let's start by coming back to Laura Mulvey's concept of the gaze, and male gaze in particular, in media. While, as you mentioned, a fair few critics argue that Sherman was perpetuating the problem, there were also a large number who concluded that Sherman was in fact parodying, reclaiming, and or subverting the male gaze in an empowering way. Linda Hutchian, who you may remember from my video on the history of parody, She's great, I love her. She has written on so many interesting topics. Anyway, the point is, um, she was one of these people. In her book, The Politics of Postmodernism, published in 89, so maybe like a decade or so after Sherman made most of these images, um, Hutchian wrote that Cindy Sherman has found another way to contest that maleness of the gaze. Her many self-portraits, which offer her own body in the guise of social or media stereotypes, are so self-consciously posed that the social construction of the female self, fixed by the masculine gaze, is both presented and ironised, for she herself is the gaze behind the camera, the active absence presence, the subject and object of her representation of woman as a sign, of woman as positioned by gender. Basically, by positioning herself as both model and photographer, she is fully in control of the viewer's gaze, regardless of their gender. She's not just settling into a passive role to be objectified and sexualized and enjoyed by men. She's a very active participant. She's in control. That said, she's still clearly very aware of the male gaze, as many shots choose to imply there's some kind of man off screen looking at the woman in the photo in some way or another. Take image number 30, for example, and warning, although this is just makeup, it does represent domestic violence, and so it may be difficult for some people to look at, and you may want to skip ahead maybe two minutes or so, I'm guessing. It's going to be difficult for some to look at and for some people to hear this bit, I understand personally, don't worry, so if you need to skip, please do. But image number 30, made in 1979, we see a young woman with black eyes, a swollen lip, tears in her eyes, looking fearfully up at someone just above the camera. The woman herself is just about as ordinary as it gets. No distinguishing features, 
a generic haircut, no obvious clothing, even the background's just an empty window, because this woman could literally be anyone. She could be any one of us. The amount of women who suffer violence at the hands of men is disgusting. Whenever I bring this up, men like to counter this by saying, well, men are more likely to assault other men than assault women. But that's not the stat we should be looking at. Women are more likely to be assaulted by men than women. Plus, as all the studies point out, and I quote, women experience higher rates of repeated victimization and are much more likely to be seriously hurt or killed than male victims of domestic violence. That's not to say domestic violence against men isn't an issue or violence against men isn't an issue at all, because it is, and it's a very important one that needs to be discussed, but this doesn't mean it's not still an incredibly serious issue for women and one which is a little too universal for my liking. It's important to have conversations about both, but there's a time and a place for each one, and saying, oh, well, we can't talk about women being victims because men are too, is kind of undermining. Just like if we tried to talk about uh, male victims and we said, yeah, but women are victims too, that's also undermining. There's a time and a place for these things. And anyway, the point is, Sherman specifically chose to show a very average woman in this photo because sadly, this type of violence absolutely happens to the average woman. It can and does happen to any of us. And many of you will know I have experienced this firsthand. It doesn't matter how smart or successful or independent and in control you think you are, it can happen to you. It does happen to you. I want you to look at this photo and notice how the camera's positioned on the same level as the woman, so we're on an equal footing with her. We understand her. We empathise with her. The presumably man, because he's, he's taller than her, he's bigger than her, and he's taller than us. The man she's looking at is above her and above us. We're all beneath him. We're less powerful than him. We feel him as a threat. It shows that men have the physical power in this situation, but it's in no way a celebration of that. It's a critique of that. It's raising awareness of that. Plus remember the man is off on his own. The viewer and the subject, we're on the same level. A team. There's solidarity there, and there's a powerful message in that. Contrast this to incredibly powerful and empowering shots like number 58, in which we see a strong, mysterious woman in a fancy black lace scarf standing in front of a tall building in the city. The camera's positioned beneath her to make her seem more tall, to make her seem more powerful. She looks slightly behind her and off into the distance, barely even aware that we, the viewer, are there, because she's so focused on her own life, her own thoughts, her own stuff. She's all that matters. We're little to her, we're beneath her, because she's that powerful. The male gaze never even comes into this, because there's no sexualizing or objectifying her, even if a man does look at this. All the viewer sees is a strong, independent woman, and you wonder, where's she going? What's she doing? You wonder who is she, not what she looks like. As a woman, I find myself looking at this and thinking, damn, this is the kind of woman I want to be. Strong, confident, in control, powerful. Other photos in the series are a little more ambiguous though. Take number 13, for example, right? We see a beautiful young blonde girl, a student perhaps, reaching up for a book. As she's posed, she looks behind her and her chest is pushed out in a pose that's pretty typical of what women were encouraged to do at the time. The focus is drawn to her body, even though she's dressed all in white and made to look pure and innocent, like men at the time, absolutely fetishized. By portraying all these stereotypes in one photo, is Sherman giving men exactly what they want? Is she making the problem worse? Is she making herself out to be an object, to be sexualized, to be enjoyed by men? Or is this actually a subtle critique on those types of shots? Look again at where the camera's focused on this shot, where it's actually focused. It's not on her body or her face, it's on her hand and the book she's reaching for. This suggests that instead of focusing on how a woman looks, we should be treating her as an actual human being, which is shocking, I know, <laughs> and focusing on what she does, her actions, her thoughts, her knowledge, instead of just her body. And look at this particular character's face. She looks upwards at someone, again, probably because of the height difference as a man, we can imagine, and her face looks tired, it looks bored. It's like she's saying, mate, really? Here's a woman who is very aware that she's probably been looked at sexually by a man. She's not stupid, she knows it's happening, and she is not having any of it. She's like, come on, I'm trying to get a book, stop it. 
And for that reason, I would say this absolutely is a feminist image. It is subverting the norm and it is empowering women. And it's showing us that we need to think more about the images we're seeing. We need to look past this. Oh, it's just a pretty woman. And we need to dig for more substance underneath. Anna Kirchhoff sums this up fairly well when she writes, here is a revolutionary feminist attempt encouraging female spectators to review their subjection, to inspect their internalization of images of femininity, and after having recognized their misrecognition as feminine subjects, to try to look and see who they really are. There are plenty of cases where Sherman adopts these stereotypical roles in her photos, but changes them up in really subtle ways, parodying them or critiquing them, or, or both. Take another image right from the beginning of the series, like number six, for example. Uh, Zhui Chi Lu, I really hope I'm saying her name right still. She writes about the um, images like this in a way that sums it up far better than I ever could. She says, Sherman masks her face with an empty gaze and unnatural expression, so as to defamiliarize the female stereotype she critiques. Sherman's ambiguous approach solicits female spectators' multiple responses, including sympathy, alienation, resistance, anger, and critique. Although female spectators may come to understand the internal contradiction of Sherman's masquerade, they may still negotiate for themselves the potential presence of a strong feminine agency, which owns the gaze, resists women's victimization, and criticizes patriarchal dominance. Sherman also liked to include these kind of femme fatale characters in her work, and there's a hell of a lot of debate about them as well. We often see them in empty corridors, walking down dark alleys, they often seem somewhat vulnerable. And because of this, some have criticized Sherman's work for portraying women too often as victims. But on the other hand, many have said that instead, and I quote, Sherman always poses in such a way as to exhibit the femme fatale's independence, aggression and dominance, not her doom. And that Sherman takes the femme fatale as her role model because it allows her to negotiate an active female desire, fantasy and power. I find that number 55, taken in 1980, to be the perfect example of that. The woman's alone on an almost pitch black street. And this should be scary. It should seem really intimidating. And in real life it would be. But here, the main lighting is all focused on her. And she's not huddled up. She's not looking fearful. She stands tall, shoulders back, chin up, confident, completely in control, hands in pockets, her outfits put together perfectly, not a hair out of place. She's in charge here. Even if she's kind of out of her comfort zone, she's in charge, and I love that. There's also something very empowering that I find about Sherman's character being the only one in every shot. Sometimes we see maybe like an outline or a silhouette of another person she may be interacting with, or we, we get a sense of an interaction off screen, but Sherman is always the only actual person in her shots. She's always the focus, the lone woman. Some critics did not like this, they hated this. So back to Jessica Sprague Jones and Joey Sprague, they argued, this is a major departure from the lived experiences of most women. Their responsibilities at home, in the community and at work tend to link them with other people, especially other women and children. But I have to disagree, like, like a lot. I believe that only showing women alone sh served two purposes. One, it shows how being forced into those traditional gender roles can, even when you're surrounded by people, feel incredibly lonely and isolating. Take image 10, for example, in which a housewife crouches on the floor picking up a spilled bag of groceries. She stares disappointedly at someone off camera who's clearly watching her, but not rushing to help. She's completely on her own. And two, I think when it's not showing how lonely some women feel, I think it's showing how damn awesome women can be when they choose independence and how you don't necessarily need a huge group of women or children around you to be successful and happy. If anything, in the majority of these shots as a whole, the sadness seems to be caused by other people, but the happy content moments seem to be when the women are just happy being alone. Look at the amazing woman in number 16, sat in this black silky dressing gown, smoking a cigarette, head held high, living her best life. Love her, she doesn't need anyone else. Number 61, taking a quiet moment to herself to stop and have a smoke outside away from whatever other responsibilities she might have going on in her life. This is a moment just for her, and we have the privilege of peeking in. 
kind of taking a sneaky little look at it. She's content by herself. She loves it. On number 34, absolute icon laying around her house, looking incredible, reading a book, and doing it all for herself. I love it. Clearly, Sherman's work is controversial and thought-provoking, and I haven't even touched on half the topics I could have but this video is already ridiculously long. I have been talking for 90 minutes so far and my voice is getting a little bit croaky, I'll be honest. I don't quite know how long this video is gonna be when edited, but I am well aware it is gonna be very, very long. And so thank you for sticking with me. If you have actually made it this far in the video, then please leave me a comment and let me know because thank you and I'm curious if anyone actually has. But to conclude, I think Sherman herself sums up her thoughts on her work fairly well in the 2003 forward to her book of collected and tied up film stills. Um, she writes, I suppose unconsciously or semi-consciously at best, I was, wrestling, I was wrestling with some sort of turmoil of my own about understanding women. The characters weren't dummies. They weren't just airhead actresses. They were women struggling with something, but I didn't know what. The clothes make them seem a certain way, but then you look at their expression, however slight it may be, and wonder if maybe they and not what the clothes are communicating. I wasn't working with a raised awareness, but I definitely felt that the characters were questioning something, perhaps being forced into a certain role. And for this reason right here, I think Sherman manages to capture what is so fundamental to being a woman, to the female experience. We are so often continually questioning our roles in society, in our lives, in the lives of others, questioning who we are. And even if you can't relate to these particular cis, white, straight, middle-class women, I think many of us can relate to being forced into roles we don't fully accept or that feel too restrictive for us or too shallow or just painfully wrong. That said, it's also completely understandable why there are critiques of Sherman's work. Some warranted, others mm, debatable, but it's that debatableness, which is totally a legit word that I didn't just make up, that I think is so damn important and interesting and worth discussing. I nearly said debating again. <laughs> I know I've mentioned her work a lot in this video, but if you go away and read just one paper reference in my sources list below, I would thoroughly recommend uh, Zhui Chi Lu's 2010 paper titled Female Spectatorship and the Masquerade, Cindy Sherman's Untitled Film Stills, which is one of the most thorough and balanced analyses of these images that I have ever read. It is a fantastic paper, seriously. She argues that in placing her body in front of her lens, Sherman is both the artist and the model, subject of the gaze and object of it, which we've already discussed in detail earlier. However, she also goes on to, sh to say, Sherman's self-representation is founded on contradiction, which will similarly evoke female spectators' conflicting responses. This explains why feminist critics have contradictory interpretations of Sherman's work. It also makes one continually experience a feeling of yes, but when reading crit criticisms defending or attacking Sherman's masquerade. And I could not agree more. It's literally what we've been doing throughout this video. On both sides, sides of the argument, I've been like, some say this, and yes, but... <laughs> Perfect. And this is what I think a good piece of art does. It makes us question and think and form our own conclusions. It never just tells us this is what it means and if you disagree you're wrong. There's never a right or wrong way to consume art. There's never a right or wrong way to interpret it. It just is and then we all go away and come to our own conclusions. That's what art is. Art is there to facilitate conversations, whether that's mundane conversations about, oh, I really love the color yellow, and I do, can you tell? <laughs> or deeper conversations about, wait, just how are women being portrayed in the media and art worlds, and what does this mean, and why should we change this, and is this exploitation? The first step towards any change is stimulating a conversation about the problem, and so even if you come to the conclusion that Sherman is perpetuating stereotypes, and encouraging objectifying male gazers, or you just don't like her photos very much. You can't deny that they've been a fundamental part in the conversations about female representations in art and the media today and the last 40 years. Even if you look at Sherman's work and don't directly feel represented in this, you can't deny the role that she and her work have played in paving the way for all other media and art you consume, which does represent you, and which 
and which will hopefully continue to represent you on an even bigger scale in the future. Sherman has been incredibly influential and for that I just absolutely thoroughly applaud her and find her work fascinating. But those are just my thoughts and I would like to hear yours uh, down in the comments please. Do you like these photos or do you hate them? Do you think Sherman is a feminist or not? Do you think her work is a feminist or not? Does it even matter? What do you think about the role Sherman's photography has played in the wider world of art and media? Can you think of any of the works which may be influenced Sherman or were influenced by her? Uh, I just generally want this to spark a conversation with you. I want this to spark thoughts in you. I want you to go away hopefully having learned something or seen something from a different perspective or just, I just want to give you something to think about. That's the point of this video and that's the point of all my videos really. I'm not here to tell you what's right and what's wrong. I'm just here to ask questions and get you thinking. Um, and so with that, thank you for watching today. Thank you for giving me so much of your time and sharing so much of this time with me and for giving me the opportunity to talk about these things that I love and for being a part of it. I cannot wait to hear your thoughts. Please go check out all the further reading and sources linked in the description below. Please consider, consider supporting my channel if you can, but if you can't, absolutely no pressure. If you're new here, it would be great if you subscribe. And that is me done. I'm done rambling. I've remembered the soft promo bit this time. I never do that. But thank you for watching today. I appreciate you all a lot. And I will see you again very, very soon. <sighs> Good night.